All right, peace and good news, YouTubers. Okay, so welcome to part 15 of my R&B is Dead, What the F Happened series. And you know, it's kind of crazy because I really never thought it would get this far into the series. I thought it would kind of fizzle out after like part five or six, but you guys continue to request it, so I'll continue to make videos. So what I want to do in this one is I want to backtrack to one of my favorite time periods in music. And you know, I think in this video I'm going to talk about just a few favorite moments in music that I have. But I want to backtrack to a time period where there were three prominent sounds. And this is between about 1989 to going into early 93. And this is the time period where you had New Jack Swing, house music, and then you had the lane for all the balladeers. Now what I liked about that era was this is a time period where there were so many record labels and so many different music groups and independent companies that there was a plethora of artists, just a whole, just a landscape full of just artists because there were so many different you know, opportunities and outlets for them to be released and distributed. So there was so much variety to choose from. And what I liked about it is, with those three lanes that I, I brought up, there was so much variety within it. So when you talk about, like, the house music, if you were somebody who wasn't big into somebody like C.C. Peniston, you could listen to Black Box, you could listen to um, Crystal Waters, you know, if you want to go a little bit more commercial, you could do, like, C&C Music Factory or Tin City or Jamanda. Like, you could go and, and just go and have a free-for-all. And then on top of that, rappers were also jumping into the house music sound. So you had, like, Queen Latifah doing the, um, I forgot what the name of the song is, but it's, she's talking about the Give Me Body, come into my house. And then you also had the other, you know, Girl, I'll House Shoot. All, you know, you had all that going on. And then as far as New Jack Swing, and you had all kinds of people that were out. So you had like the Bell Bib DeVoe, and I know you guys always go up for Poison. That's, listen, I like Poison, I've always enjoyed Poison, but I always thought it was so cliche. Maybe it's because with all the different dance groups that I've worked with, whenever we've done anything throwback where it's like, oh, we need to do a New Jack Swing piece, the first song that always comes my, oh, Poison, Poison! I'm like, damn, okay. Maybe it's because I always thought She's Dope was a better single from Bell Bib DeVoe, the video version, not the one on the album, unless you want to talk about the remix album, but I always thought She's Dope was a better single. But anyway, you had acts like Bell Bib DeVoe and Bobby Brown was doing his thing and, you know, Teddy Riley and Guy and you had all these New Jack Swing artists and once again the rappers were on the New Jack Swing sound as well. So you had people like Big Daddy Kane and Father MC and Kid and Play and all of them, they were having a good time with the New Jack Swing sound. And even people like Quincy Jones, you know, he did the, the remake of the Brothers Johnson, I'll Be Good To You with Ray Charles and Shaka Khan. Like, New Jack Swing, as I've told you, is my favorite genre of, of my favorite element of R&B music, because that's when music was just live and funny. You could just, you just got down. And then on the other side, you had the whole era for the, the crooners, the balladeers. So, Tony Braxton was just starting to emerge, kind of coming out of like 92. You know, Johnny Gill was kind of dipping and dabbing between New Jack Swing and doing all the R&B battles. Mickey Howard was still hanging in there. Anita Baker hadn't disappeared yet. Um, so you had all these different lanes. And the cool thing about it was there was just so much variety. But what I noticed is there were a few acts that specifically took those trends that were out and revamped them. And that's what I want to talk about today is, you know, right now we're in a limited scope as far as what's out and what you can listen to because everybody's on the same trend. It's either you're on the DJ Mustard Sound or you're an R&B singer that's singing over a trap beat and you're doing the Bryson Tiller route or you're doing the route where there's some kind of inclusion of something related to Future, the rapper, as far as that sound. That's, those are the three sounds that you get at the moment, which, you know, they all pretty much kind of are the same minus the DJ Mustard beat. But, um... You know, everybody's on that trend. So what I was going to say is sometimes there are artists who are not able to set a trend because they're in a, in a status where they don't carry that much power. In a previous video, I forgot which one, but I talked about how I feel that a song like Janet Jackson's That's the Way Love Goes kind of helped to, well not help, but kind of close the casket on New Jack Swing and kind of ushered in a movement where everything was going to slow down a little bit. Um, so, you know, something like That's the Way Love Goes kind of ushered in other songs like In Vogue, Runaway Love, or... Um, TLC Creep, which was still a fun, upbeat song, but it was so much more mellow, and I just feel like, uh, oh, and Babyface had came out with the, um, This Is For The Cool In You, and by then Tony Braxton had really emerged, so she had like the How Many Ways, so all of those songs and stuff, just a year and a half earlier, everybody was New Jack swinging and humping around with Bobby Brown and TLC, and now everything is slowed down. So I was saying that at that time, I think Janet's sound with That's The Way Love Goes had really ushered in the idea that let's slow things down a tiny bit, we're going to change this BPM on all these up tempos, and we're just going to change things a bit and slow it down, and that kind of ushered in a, a, a sound where everything kind of, you know, everything just flowed a little bit differently. But everybody doesn't get that same status, and the reason I always use Janet is because, you know, between 86 and 2001, she literally ran the industry for her lane. 
But um, everybody isn't in that same caliber and position, so it's hard for a lot of these artists that are out now to do that. I think the only two people in R&B or that are considered R&B at this point who have that kind of power to change what everybody else is doing as far as music is probably Beyonce and Rihanna. But Beyonce is choosing to kind of stay on the trap sound. You know, she's releasing songs like 7-Eleven and Formation and Bow Down and Flawless and you know, which which is cool, I guess. But you know, I, I would like to see her kind of branch out more because she comes out of that. She's that. She graduated from that same class with Usher. Uh, you know that that era where you know they still are old enough to grow up on people like Marvin Gaye, but still young enough to be relevant in today's music society. So it's kind of like you know Beyonce had such a good ear for music. I just would like to see her revamp, the, you know, what she's doing. So I'd like to see what she has on this up and coming project. Um, and you can tell that Beyonce has a good ear for music because even when she has songs like a 7-Eleven or a Formation or, you know, all these trap songs that don't require a whole lot of musicality and a whole lot of singing where it's more so her just kind of talking over a beat and harmonizing with her own speaking vocals. When she does it live, all of a sudden there's all these extra instruments and stuff incorporated. So I'm like, yeah, Beyonce, you know what the standard is. I need you to live by it. But anyway, um, going back to what I was saying, if we go back to like 92, early 93, um... There were two songs that were out in that New Jack Swing era that I think kind of changed the way that New Jack Swing was going to be um, presented from that point on. Maybe not even 92, almost maybe even early as 91 for the first one. The first one I was going to say was Ralph Tresvant's Sensitivity, and the second is Jay Don't Walk Away. If you listen to Ralph Tresvant's Sensitivity and you think about what R or New Jack Swing was doing before that song came out, Everything was so hard-hitting. It was really emphasis on the dance beat, real emphasis on just the hard-hitting drums, the downbeat, the twos and the fours, and the swing beat. That's where the emphasis was. You know, he got with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, and the emphasis became, let's put some attention on the chords. Let's put some attention on, you know, chord progression and hitting some minors and, you know, layering the vocals a little bit more and making it smoother. And what's cool about the song Sensitivity is that it's an up-tempo, but it also can fit in the club of the Quiet Storm playlist. So like a Ralph Tresvant Sensitivity, you can play at midnight in your little nighttime getting ready to go to bed playlist, or my it's late and I'm driving at 2 in the morning coming back from the club playlist, and it, it's, it's chill and it's laid back. But at the same time, you can play it at a house party and people can still get down to it back in the day. So that song kind of changed the trend because we went from something of like a Bobby Brown humping around or a TLC Ain't Too Proud to Bread Beg more so into something that had more chords and there was more musicality and it wasn't so focused on just the rhythm and the dancing. Now there was some fullness to the song. So it made everything that came out afterwards have to follow suit and include those chords because the thing about chords, and especially when you're playing in minors, is it's so appeasing to the ears. It's a euphoric sound. And the good thing about like when you have producers that have that musical background, they can find those hidden gems within different chord progressions and arrangements that the average person isn't going to find, which is why I'm going to get to a bit a little bit later about producers and who you're working with. Um, but I think that song helped to change some things and then when you talk about Jay Don't Walk Away, um, once again with the chords, Jay Don't Walk Away is so different in comparison to the other New Jack Swing songs that are out. And I always say that that's probably the best song to come out of the New Jack Swing era because one, there's two things about that song that make it literally addicting. One, it's those chords that you hear in the beginning that, you know, fluctuate throughout the song. Do -do 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 Dun, like something about that's just addicting and then when you add in that cowbell something about that repetitive cowbell that just kept going it just hooks you and then the drums and the, the, the downbeat and the instruments that they're using were just so boom and big in your face it's like this is such a good song and I think it's also it's actually like one of the last gems to come out of the New Jack Swing era because this is um sorry right now I'm about to choke but this is when New Jack Swing was like literally on its last leg. It was, it was already getting ready to phase out. And that's like one of those last big milestones from that era. And I use those two as an example because neither Jay nor Ralph Tresbaum were really big, big names at the time. Ralph Tresbaum, you know, he was bigger when he was a new addition. But as a solo artist, he had some moderate hits, but he wasn't the say-all, be-all. And Jade was a new group. You know, they had the I Wanna Love You song. Um, and I think one woman came out after Don't Walk Away. So um, basically, you know... They were newer artists, and they didn't get the opportunity to change the trend because I don't think radio would have picked them up because it was like, who are y'all? No, no, we're not doing that. You need to follow what everybody else is doing. But they took the trend and evolved it and made it fit for them and made it better. And that kind of ushered in the opportunity for an act like a Janet Jackson to come in later down the line and change the trend even more and say, okay, well, we're just going to end this whole thing and do something totally different, kind of. Um, 
And that's kind of where I was going with it, like with these newer artists. It's always important that if you're not in a position to change the trend, because if you look at R&B right now, R&B has no say in anything. You know, R&B is so infused and, and so interdependent with whatever rap is doing that they don't really get to call the shots. Basically, if there's too much musicality, if it's not street enough, if it's not something that's going to make people want to get freaking turned, then it's not going to get that kind of exposure. So it's like, well, what do these R&B acts do to kind of fit that lane? And I think what they have to do is literally you just have to twist and revamp what's already out and make it better and just make it fit. And I don't think there's anybody that's really been trying to do that. Um, I want to go back to another example. I want to fast forward to... Mm, let's go to 1999. That's one of my favorite years in music. And I like 1999 because it was a weird year in music because there wasn't really a trend that was out. Everything or the sound that was popular in 97, 98 as far as the Timbaland, Missy sound and the whole intergalactic thing and Bad Boy was still Bad Boy but Bad Boy was slowing down by the time we got to 99. There was just, there was this open area for anything to happen. Nobody knew what was going down and it's like the new millennium's coming so literally there's no original trend. So when you look at the R&B acts that were out in 1999, there was such a variety of different sounds and nobody had the same sound and I think it's because everybody was confused at where to go because the trend was dying out as far as the, the Missy because I really feel like the Missy Timbaland sound ran all of 1997-98 it, it just ran that whole era or, and even some of the Dark Child stuff at that time but um, literally there was no specific trend that was out so when you look at what was out in 99 it was the most diverse range of acts so if you just talk about girl groups first of all you had 702 they had to wear my girls at um, which was actually supposed to be a TLC song, but T Boss and Chili didn't want to listen to Left Eye. Well, she told them, I think this is a track which she used, but never mind. So, 702 had Where My Girl's At. TLC, of course, had the No Scrubs thing going. Um, Destiny's Child had the Bills, 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 and the Bugaboo, which is closer to 2000. Um, Total was their era, was the Kima and Keisha Pam era was kind of phasing out, but they still had the song Sitting, you know, Sitting Home, Waiting for You. And Black had just came out with the um, 808. And so all five of those songs sound extremely different, but they kind of all, you, th there's hints of what was being done in the past in those songs, but they're so different, and it's like, wow, that's variety. And then when you bring in the male entertainers that were in, Brian McKnight has this monster, gigantic blockbuster hit with Back at One, um, Genuine comes out with So Anxious, and None of Your Friends Business, Tyrese, you know, his, his album actually came out in 98, but Have I Told You I Love You, or um, Lately, is the song that kind of phased into 1999. Um, Prince actually came back out because um, I remember he had the the greatest romance ever been so like that had just came back out. Um, Drew Hill, they had the single. I can't think of what the single was called, but in the video it's only three of them because by then Nokia, whatever the dude's name, he had already left the group. But it's the um, dun -dun 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 I forgot the words. I had just got back from Italy, so I don't remember what the words were, but. They had just came out with that, um, so you had that thing going on, and then with the, as far as the R&B diva crooners, Faith Evans, her album era, the, I think that was Faithfully, gosh, I think that's, I'm, I think I'm naming the wrong album, but it's the one, it's the album that has All Night Long and, um, da -da -da -da, what's that song, Never Knew Love Like This Before, that was 98, but by 99 she had the last single, which was the, um, you love me, da, da, what is the name? Never Let You Go. You had that phasing into 99. Whitney Houston's My Love Is Your Love album was kind of phasing into 99, and by then, It's Not Right, It's Okay, or It's Not Right, But It's Okay was becoming really huge. And then, I know um, Mariah had, was coming out with um, the Rainbow album, so Heartbreaker had just came out, and the remix, the one with Missy and the Brat. And then, I know J-Lo was not really technically R&B, but in 1999, listen, If You Had My Love was in the R&B club, okay? The black people, she said at the black table at that time period. So, you have all those different sounds all coming out in the same year. So, when you look at how extreme all those different songs were and how different they were from each other, they all fit in the R&B category. And the reason why is because all these artists took gambles because a lot of them didn't know what the actual trend was. So, they took trends that were already out, they twisted those trends, revamped them, and made them fit for what was out. Like, a group like TLC had a gamble with something like No Scrubs because it's like, we haven't, they hadn't been out in four or five years. Nobody knew if they still had it. And it was kind of like a song that was like, okay... Well, this is different. A group like 702, you know, they were moderately popular, but boom, a song like Where My Girl's At is so left field, but it's still current and still fits in with what was happening in 98, transitioning into 99. It just worked well. And so I think that's something that a lot of artists have to do is just 
if you don't have that power to change the industry, you do have the power to revamp what's already out and make it fit. Because once you get that lane open and people are listening to you and, and you have people's attention, then you can set a trend once you have that following. Um, another thing I want to talk about is just the musicianship and overall quality of, of music. I was thinking back and I was watching the documentary on Organized Noise the other day. Um, you know, that's like the production group. They had like CeeLo and Sleepy Brown and all the men that they did all the stuff with Outkast back in the day. And, and Goody Mob, and I was like, I was watching them talk about how they did TLC's Waterfalls, and I never thought about it, but you know, overall, that's a really good song. I never really give it props because it was so big back in the day, and you just always hear, you never talk about it. It's kind of like Michael Jackson and Billie Jean. You're like, yeah, it was cool. Uh, but when you listen to the song, there's so many different layers that are within the song, just in the background vocals alone. Like, you play an acapella of that song, you hear CeeLo in the background, I, I swear I can hear Sleepy Brown in the background. You hear T-Boz, you hear Chili, you hear Deborah Killings, and somewhere I think Left Eye might have made a whisper just so she could get the credit on there for the vocals. And the cool thing about it is, you have to have an ear for music to make that arrangement work. Because one, you have CeeLo's raspy voice, which, which complements T-Boz's raspy voice. The only difference is she has a more feminine voice, so when you put those two together and blend them, it's like magic. And then you have Deborah Killings and you have Chili. And as you know, Deborah Killings was like the fourth member of TLC. She just was their backup singer, but her voice was always modeled after Chili's. So when you have Chili and Deborah Killings blending their vocals together, and you layer that on top of what T-Boz and Chili are doing, and then you add in the additional vocals and layer it and do the music, it's just a really great piece. And on top of that, they use real instruments on the song. It wasn't all just drum kits and synthesizers. So they're in the studio with real bass guitars. You know, having all that and real drum, and like they had just used a new drum kit that was out. So it's like, there was a bunch of different things that they did with that song. You could even say the same thing with a, so a song like No Scrubs, um, with just the vocals again. Because if you listen to a song like No Scrubs, you can hear Candy from Escape on the vocals. You can hear Tiny from Escape on the vocals. Once again, you hear Deborah, you hear Chili, and you can lightly hear T-Boss. She's barely on the course on that. But still, it's, there's an element of musicianship where people have an ear and they know how to pull different harmonies and different bits and different keys and blend and play with them and make them sound complete. And a lot of the music that's out today, there's that patience isn't there. Everything is such a rush. Everything is we got to get something out real hot. So it's all these different entertainers just singing over a beat. And maybe you, you, you add a little a vocal and layer it twice or dub it twice and that's it. And, and so a lot of these songs that are coming out now sound so incomplete. And it's been like that for like two or three years with a lot of the stuff that gets radio play. I'm not saying that there's a lot of um, lackluster artists out because there's some really good artists. And I always enjoy it when I make these videos and you guys name, you know, well you should check out this person, check out this person. And I'm like, I love it, I'm with you. The only issue that I have is I miss the days when all the good, the good music just got thrown in your face because of radio and the different outlets that music was, you know, distributed by. Now you have to dig deep into the trenches of the internet to find the good stuff. And I don't mind doing that, but it's just so different because sometimes I want everybody to jam with what I'm listening to. It's, there's nothing more annoying than like, somebody's like, oh, Michael, Michael, can you bring music? And I'm like, I really don't want to bring music because the minute I play something y'all don't know, which will most likely be everything in my playlist, yo, what is this? We don't want to hear this. You ain't got no future. You ain't got no Bryson Tiller. You don't got no Tori on this. You ain't got no ooh, ooh, Big Sean. I'm like, damn, all right, man, fine. I'll go, I'll go grab them too. We can play them too. So, and, and uh, one last example that I want to use, Lucy Pearl, I think was interesting because they came out towards the top of 2000. And what was great about Lucy Pearl is they were the combination of multiple groups. So you had Don from In Vogue, who was really good with the vocals and blending and learning three and four part harmonies. You had Ali from Tribe Called Quest. He was really good with the musicianship and the production with the Tribe Called Quest. He and um, Q-Tip did a lot of the production with that group. And then you also had Raphael Sadiq, who's literally the sound of Tony, Tony, Tony. And when you have three different entities coming together to make a masterpiece, that's how they came out with something like Dance Tonight, which kind of stands out in comparison to a lot of the songs that were out in 2000, which is such a very different year from 99 musically, because we could talk about Shakespeare and all the stuff that he was doing in 2000 as far as production. So it's just really interesting to see um, what people are doing and where everything is going. I'm not really sure where music is going right now, and I'm not sure what the current trend is going to turn into, but it's interesting. So I really would say that any new artist that's coming out, if your label is pressuring you and forcing you to do what everybody else is doing, then fine. Take that sound that everybody else is doing, but revamp it and do something that, you know, it reinvents the sound. It keeps it fresh. It keeps it alive. That's something that I think is missing. I think music, there's been some really great albums that come out in the last few months. You know, the problem is that the major labels are just not existing and the industry has changed so much where, honestly, you're going to flop whether you come out or not. But the thing about it is, it's just all about the quality. And I think we need that again. Quality and musicianship. 
But anyway, I think I'm at 20 minutes on this video. So I'm going to wrap up and yeah, we'll do another part. Subscribe. I'm out.